Today we're talking about baptism. In 450 AD, King Angus was the king of Munster in Ireland, and he heard St. Patrick preach and asked to be baptised. Well, this was a real coup because Angus was a great warrior, a great leader, uh, a respected pillar of the community and this uh, famous king in the region. And his conversion would lead to a breakthrough in Ireland for the good news of Jesus. The day of his baptism arrived and Patrick was there carrying his crozier. Crozier is a big long staff with an elaborate curved top and it's meant to look like a shepherd's staff. At the bottom of the crozier um, there would be a sharp pointed part which uh, would be stuck into the ground to, to lean on when you're walking the, the, the wilds of Ireland. And while preaching Pat, um, Patrick would very often wave his crozier around and slam it into the ground to make his points. Well on this occasion at the, the baptismal service of King Angus Patrick was caught up in his sermon and stuck his crozier into the ground. Unfortunately, he missed the ground and stuck it right through the king's foot. Angus, this powerful Celtic warrior, did not even flinch. And it wasn't until he was about to baptize him that Patrick saw the pool of blood at the king's feet. And after baptizing him, Patrick was so apologetic and said, why didn't you say something, O king? Why didn't you say anything? And Angus said this, well, I thought it was part of the ceremony and that I shouldn't flinch at suffering. And this was part of becoming a Christian, being baptized. I thought that just as Christ's feet were pierced, that a baptismal candidate's feet had to be pierced too. That is what you call Celtic hardiness. We're gonna talk about baptism today. A basic principle upon which all Christians agree is that the Holy Book, the Bible, is inspired by God and sets the behavior and values for Christians. The Bible says this, when you become a Christian, you are baptized. Some believe that to, uh, you become a Christian by being born into a Christian family and brought up in the faith. Others, that you make a conscious choice to follow Jesus and then are baptized. So logically, babies cannot make that choice, so some Christians would not baptize infants. And let me say at this point, um, people who believe in, in believers' baptism, it's not about whether it's adult or children, it's about whether you're a believer or not, but we'll get to that in, in a moment. Let us go back to some basic questions and some things that most Christians are agreed upon. Firstly, why do we do it? Well, I've listed three things. Firstly, Jesus' example. Obviously, we don't uh, follow all that Jesus did precisely. We don't wear sandals or, or dress the way he did, or, or we don't get circumcised, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, and, and we, but we do believe that he set an example in which we can broadly follow. There are a number of reasons for that. And one of them is that he, he is a, setting an example here for all Christians in his baptism. And that's why uh, most of the gospel writers include Jesus' baptism in their gospels. And it seems to have flowed into church practice from day one, that baptism was part of the deal when you become a Christian. Jesus example. Secondly, Jesus's command. Now, these words in Matthew 28, yeah, kind of like a command. They're more like a, this is what will happen as you walk with me, as you follow me, as you start to disciple others. Then you will be uh, baptizing and teaching folks to obey and so on and so forth. This passage here is kind of like the church's marching orders. Baptism marks the beginning of the Christian journey, or is as close to it as possible. And Jesus gave this kind of a command, whoever is a disciple will be baptized. So there's the command of Jesus, and also church practice, right from the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, the book of Acts, they asked the question, what shall we do? 
And they are answered with the, the response, well, you repent, you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit, every single one of you, and you become part of the church. It was a whole package. And all the way through the book of Acts, you see them trying to work out what that looks like, what it means to be part of this people. But it always includes a baptism in the name of Jesus. And being a Christian involves all those elements I, I mentioned and a few more. So baptism is an essential part of the conversion process, of the whole process of being a Christian. It is, if you like, in one sense, an initiation ceremony for those being brought into the faith community. And it's also a little bit like a celebration. I grew up in the UK and every year we would have the Oxford and Cambridge boat race and whoever uh, won the race, the, 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 the captain of the crew, the, the person who steered the boat, there was a, normally a little fellow would get thrown in the water afterwards as a kind of celebratory uh, ceremony, as it were, uh, of the win. It's a little bit like that. What does it mean? Well, I've got a few things here that, that strike me about what baptism means. Firstly, it's a commitment to following Jesus. To follow Jesus is synonymous with the term being a disciple. Following Christ involves obeying everything that he commanded. And he seems to have expected that his followers would be baptized. And as people are baptized, they are being obedient. They want to pledge themselves to continue in that obedience to Christ. In its Jewish background, baptism had the idea within it of joining the fight. And we see that a little bit with Jesus' baptism, which was actually very near some of the communities that practiced baptism in the Judean desert. And the idea of baptism for them was laying down their lives for the fight between light and darkness. Jesus is baptized near the desert and um, he immediately goes out and dukes it out with the devil in the desert. And I sometimes say to folks who are getting baptized, you know, the Christian life isn't easy and very often after a, what can for some be quite a high of baptism, um, there's a bit of a, a, a challenge afterwards. There's a few things that can go wrong and it's not always uh, that simple. But the idea, I guess, is being set apart for service in the kingdom of God, a little bit like an army passing out parade. Now you've been trained, now you're going to go into battle. Or perhaps we could liken it to the inauguration of an American president. If President Biden hadn't been inaugurated, then perhaps the debates would still be going on. But for the most part, with, with some significant exceptions, uh, the Everybody recognizes that he is a president. He has the authority to act as president. He has the power to act as president. And without the inauguration, the, some more contesting would have probably still gone on. But he is the president. So there's that sense in which baptism is a bit like an inauguration. An army passing out parade, an inauguration, an initiation ceremony. You can see that I'm piling up the metaphors and images for what baptism is. It's also about counting the cost. When in Matthew 28, Jesus talks about us being baptized into the name, that's quite literally what the phrase that's used there, into the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. It's the idea of entering into an allegiance. It's declaring an allegiance to this kingdom rule that Jesus declared. In 1 Peter 3, it describes baptism at in, in terms that describe it as a seal of separation, it confirms who you're following, you, the direction you're going in for your life. It marks you out as different, as set aside for Jesus, as it were. It is a commitment to discipleship. It's also a sign of love for God. Right from the earliest days of the church, whenever people were baptized, they would make a public declaration of their faith. And more often than not, it's, it, baptism is done in public places to declare to the world the person's love for God. It's a sign of something for all to see and to read. It's a public expression 
of love for God. But the reverse of that, or reverse of the other side of that, is that it's a sign of God's love for them. Baptism is a sign that God has taken the initiative, has loved them and brought them back to himself. And thus, the symbolism of baptism is, is you don't do it yourself. You don't hold your nose and duck your head under the water and declare that you're baptized. God comes to us, as it were, through the agency of the church and, and, and on behalf of the church, the, the person doing the baptism, normally the pastor. And it's the pastor who does that work. And the person is symbolically brought into new life. People don't baptize themselves. It is God who has done the work in their lives. Baptism is also a symbol of fellowship. The idea of entering into the church body. Whenever people were baptized, they would join the fellowship of Jesus' followers on earth and they would be saying, this is my family. We could talk more about that, but let's keep moving on. Baptism is a symbol of new life. The idea of repentance is, is attached to baptism. The idea of, of washing and being cleansed is attached to baptism. And that probably relates to uh, Judaism in the first century too. And the idea of burial and resurrection. The idea of going into the water and then emerging from it. You lose some of that, I think, when you pour water on. But I, I, I wouldn't um, argue too much on, on that issue. More on that in a few moments. Another aspect of what's going on with baptism is that it's an opportunity for God's activity. An opportunity for God to do something new in our lives, maybe that he hasn't done before. Maybe just to make a little breakthrough in our lives. I, I love the story of Jesus in Luke 4 and, and the, the parallel passages where the Spirit of God comes down in the form of a dove and upon him and God's voice comes out of the the clouds and out of the heavens and declares you're my beloved son I love you and, and this is a task I have for you that would be so affirming for Jesus he he was human he he needed encouragement I don't know what his love language was maybe it was words of encouragement but it, he would hear that and go right okay now's the time and now off we go we're gonna go start in the desert and deal with the enemy and thus far, in all that I've said about baptism, there hasn't been that much disagreement, major disagreement amongst Christians. A few people would want to nuance what I said and make it a little bit more uh, profound or, or distinct, but pretty much agreement on most of the issues I've just said. So next question for us to ask is when should it happen? Now, at every point in the Bible, baptism occurs when people become Christians, at the beginning of the Christian life. Now, all Christians actually agree on that. Um, but here's the disagreement. Some people will say that the Bible can, uh, excuse me, the, the Bible, the baby can ride on the back of the parent's faith until such time as it's old enough and then reaffirm uh, the baptismal vows made by the parents. Others, including myself, believe that a conscious decision needs to be part of that process. It's a process of choosing to follow Christ, and that can only occur at some age, at some age of, of maturity. Uh, maybe uh, adolescence, if we actually think that adolescents are mature, but that's another story. Um, and so there's, there's discussion there, there's debate there between Christians, but most of the time it's fairly amicable and friendly. How should it be done? Now, I have to say, I wouldn't die on a hill for this particular uh, question, but let me say this. I think the evidence leans towards preferably by immersion. Phrases in the Bible, such as they came up out of the water, they were baptizing there because there was plenty of water, quote unquote. And the Greek, uh, the, the roots of the Greek word itself have the idea of uh, to dip or to scupper a ship or to plunge something underwater, and, and are never used for pour, for pouring. And all the early church practice, both church and Jewish, 
um, involve dipping and involve fairly large pools. In fact, um, any evidence we have of early church buildings seems to have included very large pools if all they were doing was pouring on water. And it seems to be a fairly late second century introduction when fonts began begin to appear on the archaeological record. So a whole bunch of reasons, um, uh, uh, linguistically, culturally, theologically, the symbolism of going down into the depths also speaks of immersion. Makes me lean towards immersion. But like I say, I wouldn't die on a hill for it. And I've been in situations where I was baptizing frail people um, who I didn't think might not emerge uh, alive from the waters if I put them through the waters. And so I, I poured water on their heads because there's a sense also of the drenching of God's spirit in that as well. Which So you lose a little bit of symbolism in, in different methodologies. So wouldn't die on a hill, but I do think that immersion is the preferred method. I think it's also done as an open witness, not in private. Most churches would agree with that. It's done in a public service, in a, in a church normally, but historically it would have been in the out, open air at, at rivers and so on. And I've been involved in some of those in from the River Jordan, where, where a friend was baptized right across to the other extreme of the chilly waters of, of Loch Lomond, which are in Scotland. And believe me, they are chilly. So it's normally done in public, not private, and it's done with a level of, of the public knowing. It's a bit like a marriage in that sense. A marriage is a public proclamation before the world that this is where my loyalty lies to this new partner of mine. And in a sense, something similar, something covenantal is going on here, a, a, a bonding together of Jesus and us. It's normally done, even from the earliest days, with expressions of commitment, such as vows. We find, even in letters as early as the late first century, the Didache, for example, we find that vows and promises of commitment are, have accompanied baptism. And for those in Presbyterian, Episcopalian or Catholic traditions, those would normally be made by parents on behalf of the child. For people like myself, who have a bit more of a Baptistic tradition, it's part of the journey of salvation. It's the army passing out parade. And now the real action is going to begin. Now, a fellow Baptist who actually teaches in a uh, Uniting Church College said this, baptism is not the event that symbolizes a salvation already achieved. It is the act that belongs to the initial stages of the process of ever greater participation in Christ. So what is he saying there? It is part of the journey. It is part of the whole thing. And then if you see salvation as a whole journey, it's part of the journey of, of life uh, in Christ. And so he, he detaches it a little bit, he says, from the initiation part of it. Um, and he wants to attach it to the whole, as it were, the whole of the salvation uh, process. I, I, th I think that's quite helpful to think about. So the next question is, who is eligible? Well, the definition of a, a believer is a key issue of disagreement between churches in this respect. If we talk about believer's baptism, not adult or child baptism, we have to first answer what a believer is. Who and what is a Christian? On the one hand, you can say, well, God acted first. It was God's initi initiative to provide the means of coming into a relationship. And if we say that becoming a Christian has nothing to do with our choice, if you say it's all God, then baptizing babies is, is okay. But if you say that becoming Christian also involves doing something, making a response, then obviously a baby can't do that. And then the question becomes whether parents can do that on behalf of a child. One of the issues is how much weight you put on that latter question. How much are the parents uh, acting on behalf of a child allowed to do that, as it were? I get the logic of my Presbyterian, Anglican, Catholic friends, and I get the idea of corporate salvation, of a covenanted community. It takes a village to raise a child. I, I do get that, and I, I can appreciate the logic from where they are coming from and the theology from where they're coming from. But personally, I still end up with a sense that the norm involves making your own choice to walk in discipleship. It's not the exclusive uh, thing where it's all about us, and but 
it is, is it is, excuse me, it is a significant part. So it involves my cooperation with the journey of faith. It's part of the whole life journey that is salvation. So I want to say this, a believer is somebody who has accepted what God has done through Jesus and has responded by turning from sin and towards God. So in, in uh, Romans 10, it says this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with the mouth that you confess and are saved. That's what it means to be a Christian. It involves us, obviously it involves God coming to us and taking that, that massive initiative of grace on our behalf. But baptism is for believers for those who are choosing to respond to that free gift of God. And so one question remains for us to address. If you've not been baptized, what's stopping you?